blessings and salutations my friends you are with brian gomez group administrator speaker director for message of the sword ministries we are here to bring to you a special message from god's throne of grace Today, our message is entitled, A Parable of the Fig Tree. But before we begin our study of God's words, let us invite God's holy presence among us. Let us pray. Great God, mighty King, everlasting Father, in whom is everlasting strength. We bow in humble submission to your glorious divine holy presence and your supreme authority throughout the entire universe. We, your believing children, come today before thee because we believe that the Lord has a special message prepared to give unto your people today. Prepare our hearts and our minds now to understand, to receive these powerful and mighty words of truth. And with humble acceptation and acknowledgement of these divine words of truth as coming from the one and only through and living God, the glorious power and manifestation of your Holy Spirit, we pray and ask of thee that your spirit, the divine power of God, will go throughout this place. Let all the earth keep silent, for the Lord is in his holy temple. I bring myself before the Lord, and I ask of you that your divine power, Holy Spirit, would fill me, O God, with your supernatural and divine power of grace and the truth. And I ask that you will help me that I will interpret your words in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name. That when your people hear these words of truth, they will hear and understand. And all of us will humble, submit ourselves before thee in acceptation of your words and walk in humble obedience to your divine counsel. Cleanse us and wash us from all unrighteousness. And may your words go throughout this place today. And we will accept your words of truth by the grace of God and by the power of your might. We thank you, O blessed Father, for hearing and answering this our prayer. For we thank you through Christ Jesus, our blessed Savior. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Blessed be the Lord, our God. Yes, my friends, we invite you now to turn your Bibles with us to Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 to 36. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves. Ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. We will now proof text Matthew chapter 24, verses 32 to 36. 
with what we have been told in Luke chapter 21 from verses 25 to 36. This is Jesus Christ speaking here now. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption joyeth nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, ye see, and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Hallelujah. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Christ has given signs of his coming. He declares that we may know when he is near, even at the doors. He says of those who see these signs, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. These signs have appeared. Now we know of a surety that the Lord's coming is at hand. Heaven and earth shall pass away, he says. But my words shall not pass away. This quotation could be found in the last day events, chapter 2, Signs of Christ's Soon Return, page 19. Christ is coming with clouds and with glory, my friends. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. As we have been told in Mark chapter 13 and verse 26. A multitude of shining angels will attend him. He will come to raise the dead. And to change the living saints from glory to glory. He will come to honor those who have loved him and kept his commandments 
and to take them to himself. He has not forgotten them, nor his promise. There will be a reuniting of families. When we look upon our dead, we may think of the morning when the trump of God shall sound. We invite you now to turn your Bibles with us to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54. These are the words that were spoken by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory a little longer and we shall see the king in his beauty a little longer and he will wipe all tears from our eyes a little longer and he will present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy that's jude 1 and verse 24. wherefore when he gave the signs of his second coming, he said, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, When they now shoot forth, Ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. When the Savior pointed out to his followers the signs of his return, he foretold the state of backsliding that would exist just prior to his second advent. There would be, as in the days of Noah, the activity and the stir of worldly business and the pleasure seeking, buying, selling, planting, building, marrying, and giving in marriage, with forgetfulness of God and the future life. For those living at this time, Christ's admonition is, take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life and so that day come upon you unawares watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy 
to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Christ continues pointing out the condition of the world at his second coming. As we have been told from Matthew chapter 24 from verses 37 to 39. As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Christ does not here bring to view a temporal millennium, a thousand years in which all are to prepare for eternity. He tells us that as, that as it was in Noah's day, so will it be when the Son of Man comes again. How was it in Noah's day? God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. As we have been told in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. The inhabitants of the antediluvian world turned from Jehovah, refusing to do his holy will. They followed their own unholy imagination and perverted ideas. It was because of their wickedness that they were destroyed. And today, the world is following the same way. It presents no flattering signs of millennial glory. The transgressors of God's law are filling the earth with wickedness. They are betting. They are horse racing. They are gambling. They are dissipation. They are lustful practices. They are untamable passions. Are fast filling the world with violence. This quotation could be found in the Desire of Ages, chapter 69, on the Mount of Olives, page 632. The Bible talks about a day which will come to pass. When we see these things fulfilled, a day of wrath, and distress in view of that great day the word of God in the most solemn and impressive language calls upon his people to arouse from their spiritual lethargy and to seek his face with repentance and Humiliation. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 13 to 18 tells us Therefore their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation 
They shall also build houses, but not inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards, but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. A day of wasteness and desolation. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet. And alarm against the fenced cities. And against the high towers and I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and that their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. In view of that great day the word of God says to blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand Joel chapter 2 verse 1 Therefore also now says the Lord Turn even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning and rend your heart and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious. And merciful. Slow to anger. And of great kindness. And repented him. Of the evil. Verses 12. And 13. Of Joel chapter 2. trumpet in Zion sanctify a fast call a solemn assembly gather the people sanctify the congregation assembly elders gather the children and those that suck the breast let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore, shall they say among the people, Where is their God? 
That's verses 15 to 17. Let's turn our Bibles now to 2 Peter chapter 3. And we will read verses 3 and 4. We have been told, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and the saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. We want to share something with you here today, my friends. That when we read the Holy Scriptures, there is a lot of symbolism that are being used. And in order to appreciate the full and complete understanding of God's words, we will allow the Lord to show us the true meaning and interpretation of these symbols. And so the Lord is showing us that vine and the fig tree in the Holy Scriptures are symbols of God's people. So we will go through some passages of Scripture now that will verify this point. So we will first look at the book of Judges, chapter 9, and we will read from verses 18 to 16. That's in the Old Testament there. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees. And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Shall I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted? Over the trees. Then said the trees unto the vine. Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them. Should I leave my wine. Which cherish God and man. And go to be promoted over the trees. Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble. And devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made, Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jerubal and his house, and have done unto him according to the deserving of his hand, We remain in the Old Testament and we will examine the revelation of God's words from the prophet Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 13. We will be comparing scripture with scripture. To a point unto them, the Bible says, that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, 
the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Let's compare that now with Psalms 1, the first division of the Psalms, and we will read from verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. We will now look at vine as a representation of the house of God. We remain with the book of Psalms, but this time we look at the 80th division of the Psalms, and we will take our reading from verses 8 to 15. We are looking at how the Holy Scriptures use the word vine in representing the house of God. Verse 8 tells us, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it, and then it caused it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs unto the sea, and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, Look down from heaven, and behold, and visit this vine, and the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. We remain with the book of Isaiah, and we turn now to chapter 5 and verse 7. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10 tells us, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame. And their abominations were according as they loved We enjoy the beauty of the scriptures today as we notice that all God's holy scriptures, as we compile all these various passages of scripture, we will see the revelation of truth, that there is perfect harmony throughout all the scriptures as we verify today the symbolism that is used in the word of God and its proper and true meaning and interpretation. We return to Matthew chapter 20 from verses 1 to 4. This is Jesus Christ speaking to us here now. 
For the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And the said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. We turn now to Matthew chapter 21, and we will read verses 33 to 41, as we remain with the words of our Master here, Christ Jesus. We have been told, here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and killed him cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? They say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Now since we have been shown that fig tree and vineyard of grapes represents the church of God, the Lord declares that when we see them shoot forth, then we know of ourselves that summer is now nigh at hand and the kingdom of God is nigh. For the ripening of the harvest is the sign of his second coming. This means that when summer arrives, the harvest has already been reaped. And we will notice that now as we turn to Jeremiah chapter 8, and we will read from verses 18 to 20. We have been told, when I would comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of them that dwell in a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven images? And with strange vanities. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. What caused the ripening of the harvest? The Bible declares that it was caused by the day of rain. The rain here spoken of is the early and the latter rain. 
Let us find out what the Holy Scriptures says to us here in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. We have been told, Behold, the husbandman waiteth it for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord joy nigh. So the latter rain suggests that this is the divine power, the Holy Spirit of God, that will be manifested through a glorious manifestation of the outpouring of God's grace in the last days. Latter rain in the latter days or last days. We return to Isaiah chapter 55 and we will read what we have been told in verses 10 and 11. For as the rain cometh down and the snow from heaven and returneth not thither but watereth the earth and make it if bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and the bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Let us prove text Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 and 11 with Isaiah chapter 61 verse 11 as we make this comparison here now. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Hallelujah. The latter rain, my friends. Ripening earth's harvest represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up unless the early showers have done their work. The latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. You can find this quotation from last day events, chapter 13, the latter rain, page 184. You can also find this quotation in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, pages, page 506. This is the 1897 version. As you would notice, the act of Christ in breathing upon his disciples, the Holy Ghost, and, in, and imparting his peace to them, was as a few drops before the plentiful shower to be given on the day of Pentecost. Jesus impressed this fact upon his disciples, that as they should proceed in the work entrusted to them, they would the more fully comprehend the nature of that work and the manner in which the kingdom of Christ was to be set up, up uh, on the earth. John chapter 20 verses 21 and 22 tells us, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father had sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. This quotation could be found in the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 243. We turn to Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. 
Because as we compare these passages of scripture, we will understand what the meaning of rain is as a symbol in Bible prophecy. We have been told here, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to everyone grass in the field. So we are taking our time now as we go through these passages of scripture and we will understand with the comparison of comparing spiritual things with spiritual and the precept upon precept, we will understand how God uses these words in, in, a, symbol, in a symbolic manner and what it truly represents. How could the Lord instruct us to ask you of the Lord reign in the time of the latter reign and we do not know when that time is? As we ponder upon these thoughts. We turn our Bibles now to what we have been told from the writings of the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 13 and we will read verses 11 and 12. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So we consider what is the grass? What does grass represent? We turn now to Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 7. As we have been told, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord blew it upon it. Surely the people is grass. So grass represents the people. The fading flower represents the fading beauty of God's people. Unfortunately, the latter rain falls upon the earth in the latter days or in the last days and awakens the people of God with the doctrine of present truth, which is the special work for this time. So God has made a promise that there will be a glorious manifestation of the power of God through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit, the spiritual grace of God upon his people in the latter days of earth's history. Those who in mind and heart are turning away from the Lord's special work for this time, those who do not cooperate with him in establishing souls in the faith by leading them to heed his words of warning are doing the work of the enemy of Christ. This statement could be found in Selected Messages, Book 2, Chapter 7, The Divine Credentials, page 70. We are looking at some quotations now taken from the spirit of prophecy. We have been told here, If after a sufficient period of trial, it is found that any of the workers have not a conscientious regard for secret things, if they slight the messengers whom God sends, if they turn their hearts away from the message, and to show no interest in the special work for this time, they should be separated from the work, and others should be chosen to engage in it who will receive the light God sends to his people and will walk in the light. That's found in the publishing ministry, chapter 5, A Sacred Work, page 59, manuscript 29, edition 1895. We return to the Old Testament writings of the servant of the Lord Moses and examine what we have been told in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and we will read verses 1 and 2. And as we read this, this quotation here now, it will verify what we have shared with you thus far. We have been told here, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. 
and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall not shall drop, sorry, my doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. So there is a promise from God's word that there will be an outpouring, first the small rain and then the greater outpouring of the heavy showers. And we will verify what this means from God's words. We are now to ask. To ask you of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. But then how can we ask you of the Lord for the latter rain in the time of the latter rain and we do not know what that time is? Do not rest satisfied, my friends, that in the ordinary course of the season, rain will fall. Ask for it and believe for it and so shall it be done unto thee. The growth and perfection of the seed rest not with the husbandman. God alone can ripen the harvest, but man's cooperation is required. So in humble submission to the Lord, we must cooperate as co-laborers with the Lord, and the Lord will fulfill his divine promises in our lives. God's work for us demands the action of our mind, the exercise of our faith. We must seek his favors with the whole heart. If the showers of grace are to come upon us, we should improve every opportunity of placing ourselves in the channel of blessing. Christ has said, Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. That's Matthew chapter 18 verses 18 and 19. The convocations of the church as in camp meetings. The assemblies of the home church and all occasions where there is personal labor for souls are God's opportunities for giving the early and the latter rain. Please take notice, my friends. But let none think that in attending these gatherings, their duty is done. A mere attendance upon all the meetings that are held will not in itself bring a blessing to the soul. It is not an immutable law that all who attend general gatherings or even local meetings shall receive large supplies from heaven. The circumstances may seem to be favorable for a rich outpouring of the showers of grace. But God himself must command the rain to fall. Therefore, we should not be remiss in supplication. We are not to trust to the ordinary working of providence. We must pray and pray always and pray without ceasing that God will unseal the fountain of the water of life. And we must ourselves receive of the living water. Let us with contrite hearts, my friends, pray most earnestly that now in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace may fall upon us. God said that we are not willing enough to ask you of him for the Holy Spirit. God wants us to trouble him with this matter, my friends. He wants us to press in unto the throne of God, to present our supplications to the throne of God's grace that he will pour out his Holy Spirit upon his children. God wants to pour out his spiritual grace upon us. But we are, not, we, we are unprepared to receive it. So our prayer today must, to, must ask the Lord to cleanse 
and purify our hearts from all impurities of the flesh and to mortify the deeds of the flesh, my friends. That God will cleanse his holy temples that he could pour fresh wine into these bottles, my friends. Hallelujah. At every meeting we attend, our prayers should ascend that at this very time God will impart warmth and moisture to our souls. As we seek the Lord for the Holy Spirit, it will work in us meekness, humbleness of mind, a conscious dependence upon God for the perfecting latter rain. If we pray for the blessing in faith, we shall receive it as God has promised. That's testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Chapter 71. Pray for the latter rain. Page 508. In conclusion. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face. And I heard a voice of one that speak. That's Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 28. In the day of rain, a sprinkling or a small rain takes place first. Before the great outpouring of the heavy showers, which finally empowers the remnant church of God without measure. This is why it is that a cloud and a rainbow were seen upon the head of the mighty angel during the day of rain. And we would look at that now in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were, the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. We have been told from God's messenger that this mighty angel here represents none other but the personage of Jesus Christ himself. It is the rain which causes the blade to blossom, and bud during the time of the harvest he shall cause them that come of jacob to take root israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit that's isaiah chapter 27 and verse 6 when the fruit is brought forth Immediately, he put it in the sickle because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting, my friends, with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. That's Christ's object lessons, chapter 3. First the blade, then the ear, page 69. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's Matthew chapter 9 verses 37 and 38. For where a hundred workers could be doing the work of God, in many places there are only one. We need to arise and wake, my friends, and let every individual who are called by the name of Christ participate towards the global proclamation of the gospel of Christ, which is the power of God unto salvation. After Jesus had sent the multitude away, and had retired with his disciples into the house. They asked him to explain the parable that he had given them. And he answered. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. 
the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tears are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tears are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, Chapter 19, The Other Parables, page 249. Finite mind, finite man is likely to misjudge character. But God does not leave the work of judgment and pronouncing upon character to those who are not fitted for it. We are not to say what constitutes the wheat and what the tears. The time of the harvest will fully determine the character of the two classes specified under the figure of the tears and the wheat. The work of separation is given to the angels of God and not committed into the hands of any man. That's testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Chapter 1, the Church of Christ, page 400, page, sorry, page 47. At that time of the final crisis, when every earthly support is cut off, we will be required to go through the time of trouble in the sight of our holy God without a mediator. Sinful beings cannot approach a holy God. How then can we face him? Unless we overcome now every defect and weakness of character. This sprinkling time of the latter rain is given for the purpose of character development. By the great outpouring which is given during the little time of trouble when the, when the Sunday law is passed in America is to empower the saints of God to go through that time. You see, God will not pour out his Holy Spirit upon us with weaknesses and defects upon characters. So it, was, it is our responsibility now to remedy these defects in our characters by asking of the Lord for his Holy Spirit, which is in the time of the small rain, to remedy these defects and get rid of these weaknesses and defects of character so that he can pour out his great manifestation of the outpouring of the latter rain without measure upon us. And signs and wonders shall follow the believers, my friends. Christ had bidden his people watch for the signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming king. We have been told by Christ himself, when these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption joint nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, When these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption joint nigh. And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree, and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see, and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. That's Luke chapter 21, 
verses 28 to 30. And this quotation could be found in the Great Controversy, the 1888 edition, Heralds of the Morning, chapter 17, page 308. The ripening of the grain represents the completion of the work of God's grace in the soul. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God's divine power, the moral image of God is to be perfected in the character. We are to be wholly transformed into the likeness of Christ. The latter rain, ripening earth's harvests, represents the spiritual grace that prepares the church for the coming of the Son of Man. But unless the former rain has fallen, there will be no life. The green blade will not spring up. Unless the early showers have done their work, the latter rain can bring no seed to perfection. Christ is waiting with a longing desire to see himself perfectly manifested among his people. And when he sees his character perfectly reproduced among us, then shall he come to claim us as his own. There is to be first the blade, then the air, after that the full corn in the air. There must be a constant development of Christian virtue, a constant advancement in Christian experience. This we should seek with intensity of desire, that we may adorn the doctrine of Christ, our Savior. Unless we are daily advancing in the exemplification of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. It may be falling on hearts all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. That's testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. Chapter 71, Pray for the Latter Rain, pages 506 and 507. It is high time that we awake out of sleep in the Lord's vineyard. There should be 100 workers where now there is but one. If we move forward in faith the Lord will care for us he declares seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink neither be of doubtful mind for all these things do the nations of the world seek after and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things but rather seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Hallelujah. The Review and Herald, the 27th of May, 1902. If in the providence of God you have been given means, do not settle down with the thought that you need not engage in useful labor, that you have enough and can eat and drink and be merry. Do not stand idle while others are struggling to obtain means for the cause. If you do less than your duty in giving help to the perishing, remember that your indolence is incurring guilt. Before it is forever too late, begin to reform. Invest less in the worldly enterprises and use your means in creating increased facilities for giving the third angel's message to the world. The time will soon come when no man can buy or sell save he 
who has the mark of the beast. We have no time to lose. The end is near. But opportunity is still offered for your talent of means. Now buried in worldly possessions. To be transferred to the Lord's work. God desires his people to do far more for the establishment of his church. Far more for the maintenance of the cause of truth. Keeping the glory of God in view will enable us to make a wise use of his goods. If God gives us much of this world's goods, it is not that we may selfishly hoard them or that we may crave for more, but that we may freely impart to those not so richly blessed. Nothing so refreshes the spirit as giving gladly and willingly of the blessings God has so freely given us. The life of the soul is revived by the sight of the good thus accomplished and by a sense that a conscientious use has been made of the Lord's goods. All are being tested and tried by the way in which we do the work Christ has given us to do in his absence. We decide our future destiny. Many neglect their God-given work. They refuse to be his helping hand. Let us fear to fall short of God's plan for us. His servants are to be ever on duty. Working always for the uplifting of those for whom he gave his life. The Review and Herald, May the 27th, 1902. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves. He know that summer is nigh. Now since we have been shown that fig tree and vineyard of grapes represents the church of God, the Lord declares that when we see them shoot forth, then we know of ourselves that summer is now nigh at hand and the kingdom of God is nigh. For the ripening of the harvest is indeed the sign of his second coming. Amen. And Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord our God. It was truly a privilege of sharing God's words with all of you here today. We want to shout out our greetings with glad thanksgiving for all of you who have made the effort to join with us in studying of God's divine words today. Let us go forward in faithful duty for the Lord. We do not have much time remaining. Probation is soon about to close. And God is calling for the faithful to stand up in this hour of perplexity. This long and eventful history of our earth is soon about to come to a cataclysmic end and we all have a faithful responsibility and duty to carry out 
God's divine counsels and instructions to preach the gospel unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So let us take heed to the divine counsels and instructions given to us from God's words. And so we leave with you this scripture which the Lord told us in John chapter 16. When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you and lead you into all truth. And so may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon us and to be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and grant us your peace, O God. The perfect peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Peace. Not as the world giveth, but which only you could give. Peace. Even in the midst of the storm. Thank you, O blessed Father, for hearing and answering this our prayer through Christ Jesus, our blessed Savior. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Thank you, my friends. Let us go in peace. And may the grace of God be upon all of us as we get ready for the soon coming of Christ, our Savior.